our next session of the webinar series on the uh, COVID crisis. And we have uh, three uh, outstanding scholars today who are going to talk to us about social scientific approaches to studying various dynamics of the crisis. I'll give you more information about them in just a moment. But as usual, I'd like to begin by uh, sharing some orienting information about our series where there's more information and uh, give you some updates. So once again, this is the uh, address for our homepage where we're updating information uh, as, uh, on a weekly basis. I wanna point out some new additions on the website. Uh, and one is this, that we are now populating, uh, increasing the population of links to uh, the recorded sessions uh, from the past webinar meetings. And we have also gotten the slides from a couple of our presenters. We're putting those linked to the home page as well. Also, we still are offering our mailing list if you would like to sign up to get announcements of uh, future events and ongoing events in the series. That's the place where you may do so. As far as today's webinar goes, I would just like to point out to people if we are able to uh, get to the end of the session and leave a few minutes for questions and answers. We'd like to draw on submissions that you might put into the Q&A session, the Q&A uh, facility for the uh, Zoom webinar. You should find that button near the bottom of your screen. We'll watch for questions. We often run out of time, but if we don't, we'd like to hear what you would like to ask our panelists today. Our panelists today are a, a very distinguished group of scholars. I'd like to say just a few words uh, about them. Uh, before we uh, ask them to share their comments. He Zheng Kim is a professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at UCSB. She served as an editor for all the most prestigious journals in the field of social psychology. Her own research has been funded by numerous grants from the National Science Foundation, and that research studies how culture influences psychological processes that affect a variety of outcomes, and we'll hear about some of those outcomes today when she talks to us about American xenophobic tendencies as the pandemic threat increased from being remote to being very urgent. Following Professor Kim, we'll hear from Professor David Sherman, also from the Psychological and Brain Sciences Department. Uh, Professor Sherman is currently the editor of the journal Personality and Social Psychology Review, one of the most prestigious in the field. He has also received numerous awards from the National Science Foundation. He studies the role of the self in responding to threats and stressful events. Uh, and he'll be using that knowledge to describe how Americans evaluate different policies about restarting the economy sooner or later, among other policy differences, and with special attention to the role of political orientation and how that affects people's evaluations. Our third speaker today, Professor Robin Nabby from the Department of Communication. Professor Nabby, the former editor of the journal Media Psychology. She's a fellow of the International Communication Association. She does research on the persuasive influences of emotion in mediated messages, including health and social issue messages. And that expertise will uh, help her to bring to you findings about how people are coping with the COVID-19 stay-at-home order with particular attention to media use. So thanks for indulging me in that long introduction, but it is a, a really great set of speakers today. And with that, I would love to hear what the speakers have to say. We'll begin with Professor Kim. And Hello, can you Dr. hear me? Kim, there we go. We needed, okay, to, needed to unmute, but now you're good. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so first I'd like to thank Joe and Ambush for organizing this incredibly intellectual stimulating series, and I'm very excited to be part of the group. All right, so first I wanna kind of make a little bit of time travel and back, wanna move us back to February 2020, okay? And just I'll share you know, a couple of media uh, response to word COVID-19. And something like this in our early period. So this is before the disease got the name of COVID-19. And um, it says, who said it's not safe to travel to China? And um, 
this, this uh, sentence here, the coronavirus travel ban just on Justin doesn't work anyway, which I think is still valid argument. But however, you can kind of sense the, uh, the feeling at the time that, you know, this is a problem of China and, you know, it's a little bit overblown sort of a sentiment. Another one here, um, it says, get a gripe from America. The flu is a much bigger threat than coronavirus. At least this author has sense to add for now here. And the last one is just a picture. This is from Mardi Gras this year. And, um, you know, toward the kind of mid to end part of the Mardi Gras uh, that happened at the time, it was just went ahead. And you can see all this, you know, thousands, tens of thousands gathering. And, you know, obviously they're not social distancing. So that was, you get a clear sense that how America view coronavirus at the time, which is, it is clear that people are aware of this issue. However, people still thought of it as a Chinese problem, not really American problem. So if you fast forwarded a little bit and move to now mid-March and, you know, you see pretty different shift. Um, on uh, March 19th, um, you know, California is the first state um, and along with the, you know, some other states like New York and uh, Illinois, and they studied the stay in uh, uh, the shelter in place order in place and clearly showing that it's no longer just Chinese problem. And, you know, these numbers are obviously very different. This number is much larger. I think it's more like four in five um, Americans order to, uh, order to stay home uh, during this crackdown. But at the time, you can start to step people start to say, wait, you know, this is not really foreign problem, but rather American problem. And this is a little bit dramatic, but, you know, now people, it's it starting to feel like it's saying such a thing is appropriate. This, this land of denial and death and COVID-19, the dark side of American exception, uh, of exceptionalism. So, so within near to a month time period, you can kind of see how America was seeing the problem and being aware that it's going on, but thinking that it's not really our problem as opposed to by March, it became American problem. While this is happening, obviously the concern of uh, the COVID-19 is impacting um, a lot of our lives, you know, the, some of, of the most important part of our lives, something like health and economy, but it also has other kind of social impact. For example, um, even at the sort of beginning of February, people start to notice uh, xenophobic tendency. So what's spreading faster than coronavirus in the U.S.? Racist assaults and ignorant attacks against Asians. Similar idea a little bit later, but in 19 coronavirus is uncovering anti-Asian racism. And, and it turned out that even on college campus, uh, people are sensing more of this xenophobic tendency. And what's interesting here is that it's not just the, uh, the anti-Chinese sentiment that was appearing, but also more generalized sense of xenophobia, including anti-Semitic and also anti-immigrant and so on. So I wanna talk about xenophobia. And there's actually a lot of research linking disease and xenophobia. It turns out that xenophobia is one of the most kind of go-to psychological and social level um, reaction people show. So xenophobia defined as uh, fear and hatred of strangers or foreigners or of anything that is strange or foreign. And, um, you know, some scholars, so this, this association between disease threat and xenophobia has been found in many different fields. Uh, you know, sometimes people conduct a historical analysis and there's nothing unique about COVID-19 on the particular um, um, aspect. So in relation to bubonic plague, cholera, yellow fever, among other diseases, they found out that the first thing people kind of go at the societal level worry about is keeping outsider out of, you know, you know basically infiltrating their own group and, you know, accompanied by their, uh, their hatred and fear to, toward other groups. In psychology, you know, there's a, for example, you know, one kind of most relevant theory that's called pathogen prevalence theory. And, you know, they have a large range of studies basically showing that um, in, uh, in some studies, they find that living, simply living in a much more pathogen prevalent location and, um, and uh, places, the countries and cultures, they tend to make people become much more xenophobic. And also with a more of a lab-based experiment, even reminding people about pathogens actually make people become more xenophobic. So this is a pretty well-established finding. 
So in psychology, when we measure psychological reactions, we measure in, you know, we're using a few different um, sort of uh, the items and um, factors. One kind of way to measure big action is measuring prejudices, prejudices toward outsiders. So it could be toward more targeted group or more generalized group, but nevertheless, you know, people can measure the degree to which people fear and um, hatred toward outsiders. And another component of xenophobic reaction is ethnocentrism, basically the belief that, um, you know, or the belief in the inherent superiority of one's own group. My group is so much better than other groups sort of sentiment. And the third component is people measure how much people are willing to engage in action or at least support actions of, uh, that's designed to keep outsiders out. For example, xenophobic policy support, how much people as citizens support xenophobic uh, policy support and whatnot. So these all kind of uh, uh, sort of tap on slightly different aspects of xenophobic reactions. And, but what I would like to do here is that we, I wanna separate these uh, this different uh, types of xenophobic tendency into two groups. One is xenophobic thoughts. Uh, xenophobic thought that basically prejudice, feeling fear toward the group or feeling superior against other people, that's mostly stay in your mind and thoughts. And a lot of studies shows that these thoughts serve function of making people feel better about themselves. So it's not, it doesn't obviously give a direct pragmatic protection per se, but it makes them feel relatively safer and you know, let the realm less threatened. And, but then there is a xenophobic action component, which is, uh, or support for actions, meaning that you know, these are the, the, uh, the factor that's, that may potentially be protective. Now I put it here potentially. So it doesn't have to be actually protective, but rather so long as it gives a feeling they may be protective, you know, it seems like people can increase the support for such actions or engage in such, such actions. So when we think about a xenophobic tendency into two different components, thoughts and actions, um, ordinarily, you know, tons of research find that these things tend to go hand in hand. And there's a couple of reasons. And the simple reason is that, you know, people tend to behave according to their own belief. Why wouldn't you? Um, you know, I believe in something and when there's and everything else, else is equal, I would act according to what I believe to be true. Another um, slightly less perhaps obvious um, um, tendency, uh, the underlying reason for this, uh, the reason why these things go hand in hand is because it be, people have kind of desire and motivation for psychological consistency. Basically, you don't want to seem um, hypocritical, for example, so you want to be able to match your action with your belief. So there's a lot of research supporting this idea. So, but I had ordinarily these things go hand in hand, but what happens when things are not ordinary? Um, I think we can all agree that we are not in an ordinary time. So every morning you get up and see graphs where, you know, just cases rocketing and, you know, you get so used to the picture of this of virus and, you know, sometimes gruesome images of bodies and stuff like that. You know, we are not in ordinary time. So the question we wanted to ask is whether, um, um, essentially when people experience not normal ordinary kind of threat but when people are experiencing this level of acute severe and urgent threat what happens to people's xenophobia is that do people become even more xenophobic maybe maybe not but if they become more xenophobic then who increase xenophobia more and what kind of people increase xenophobia more and also how do they become more xenophobic these are kind of the general um, guiding question uh, that underlies our research. We conducted a study, um, and this study, in this study, we collected the two sets of national, the U.S. Nation, national data. First time point was in mid February 2020. That's when Americans were aware of COVID-19, but they saw it as a relatively distant threat. So it's Chinese concern. And then the second time we collected data uh, from mid-March time period when the COVID-19 definitely became an American problem. So just to give you a very brief kind of timeline and where it's that's basically our first data, the, the uh, uh, first Taiwan data collection started of uh, February 11th. So that's when the COVID-19 got its name. And, but it would ended before it became kind of, started to become an international threat. So it ended right before, uh, 
South Korea, Italy, and IRES start to show the um, heightened level of uh, detection. And then uh, the time to data collection happened when US, uh, on the day when US national, it declared national emergency. And then it ended basically shortly after California and New York State um, placed the uh, decisions order. And then a few years later, US uh, became actually number one in the world or the confirmed cases. So what did we measure? We measured prejudice toward Chinese. It is the initial group that is associated with the disease. And then, and so, you know, the purpose of that question is we wanted to see how people feel toward the group that's specifically associated with the, with the threat. The second group, the uh, second question we, set of question we measured was, uh, asked was, you know, people's uh, prejudice toward undocumented immigrants. Obviously, undocumented immigrants are not directly related to uh, the COVID-19 per se. However, this is a kind of ongoing outsider people's been kind of talking about and we wanted to see measure how much this sense of xenophobia is generalized to group uh, beyond the group that is uh, directly associated with the, uh, the, uh, the threat at hand. And then we find uh, as a third component, we measured American ethnocentrism using a validity scale. So, so one sample exam, people in the United States could learn a lot from people from other countries. And obviously this, the, the, uh, the, the people's response was reverse coded. So higher would indicate higher ethnocentrism. So these are some of the measures we included. And then finally we included um, a, a, a kind of group protective policies. And then we asked people how much they support this policy. And the answer could range from no, I do not support this policy. Yes, I support the policy in general, but it is too rest restrictive to three. Yes, I support the policy fully and think it should be implemented. And you know, I'm not gonna read all these items, but this is a mixture of, of uh, the policy that's already sort of in place or discussed or just purely hypothetical. And some of some aspects of this policy is somewhat a little more reasonable, some are not very reasonable at all, at all. Like for example, a ban from public schools of children who have returned from regions with a high risk of coronavirus is fairly unreasonable. So we kind of wanted to look at how people sort of feel toward these um, uh, restrictive, like keeping basically outsiders out kind of policy. And then, so this is a false, false result. So if you so look at the February data, what we find is that what we would, you know, the, the results we would expect. So basically xenophobic thoughts, you know, people feeling fear and hatred toward other people also say that we should implement, implement more xenophobic policy. So there's a strong positive relation here. However, by the time we get to March, that relationship went away completely. And there's absolutely no difference between people who hold higher xenophobic tendency thoughts or not, and in terms of how much they support policy. And so here what I want to highlight is that, you know, of course, everyone support, uh, support for uh, xenophobic, uh, sorry, policy support went up when the, the situation became worse. However, the degree to which the increase happened was much higher actually for people who are not xenophobic in terms of their uh, belief. So then the next question is, uh, why do we find this, uh, this uh, change? You know, why at time on there's a strong relationship there and then so there's no relationship between belief and action. So we kind of wanted to see specifically how um, the, the thoughts and then sub policy support change at two time point. So this Y axis here is just a standard score. So this number is not you know, entirely mean, uh, meaningful. But basically what you can see is in terms of xenophobic policy support, as you would expect, there's a huge difference. So people, um, everybody became much more supportive of this xenophobic policy support at the, uh, the second time point, March time point, compared to February time point, which isn't perhaps too surprising. However, what's interesting is that people didn't really change the thought that much. If any, it actually went down. So they bec people became slightly less xenophobic, but by and large, it belief isn't what happened, what, uh, um, what changed. So essentially what we are finding is a p kind of going back to this uh, previous slide. And so these people who are not particularly xenophobic in their belief are willing to override their belief to support what seems to be protective in action. Um, so how much time do I have? Okay, I don't. I also have a set of 
uh, I'll just skip this one. I think I need to, in, in terms of uh, looking at ideology. Um, so basically, I know it's kind of this, uh, summarize the finding and, you know, what that means, I think. Um, I, I would like to talk about what it means in terms of going forward and, you know, in terms of thinking about what kind of pop public institutional or national policy people uh, are thinking about in the fighting um, against COVID-19. First of all, just to summarize, basically what this study is find, uh, showing is that people are experiencing an acute and severe threat that makes people become more xenophobic, basically replicating uh, previous uh, studies. And but what we also found is that it went it such acute and severe threat and to make people support policies, even though sometimes, some cases at least, it, it directly go against their belief. So what that means is that people who are not very xenophobic are fine with supporting uh, xenophobic phobic tendency. So based on that, I think just two kind of take message, uh, you know, I would like to highlight is that one is that this study urges caution against supporting or implementing policies out of fear or hatred for matter, and sometimes against beliefs. So, you know, when we are thinking about implementing or engaging any action, and, you know, it's important to think that, you know, first of all, is this really necessary? And, you know, how does it jive with my existing belief and sort of, step back and being thoughtful about it, I think is very important. So it sounds like it is bad uh, that people will act against their belief, but if you look at it in a different way, I think it also shows that people may be on board with um, institutional actions if it seems effective, despite their own de uh, default beliefs. What that means is that uh, when we sort of think about what's going on and what kind of policy we are debating, implementing, um, you can find some examples and you can sort of about yeah, how we can leverage this knowledge um, in a certain, uh, uh, with a certain challenge. For example, America of choice and freedom as much as anyone, but we find that out of, you know, most of Americans anyway, are willing to stay put and make their choice and freedom to go out and follow shelter in place order just because people recognize that that is something that may be protective. And one of the things we've been um, in my lab and along you know, in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Sherman is we've been kind of thinking about applying this model to understand how to sort of you know, introduce and implement potentially useful uh, policy or technique or tool, I guess, of digital contracting. So the idea is that a lot of people do value their, their privacy. And, but obviously digital contact tracing or opting in for that will have to violate their value of privacy. So the question is, um, is whether people will go for it or not. And what our research is that if, the value of technique is communicated well, perhaps we don't need to be as much discouraged about kind of preemptive, but you know how students usually worry about their uh, privacy. They don't really want the university to track their movement and stuff like that. And because what we are finding is that when um, the need is dire, people might be willing to override their uh, value to do something that's actually protective and programmatic, uh, pragmatically valuable. So this is um, current ongoing research in our lab. Um, and um, we are also trying to kind of come up with a way to you know, find the, the right way of describing something like uh, the digital contact tracing and frame it to, um, to appeal to uh, people's ex existing values and beliefs. So I think all I have to say, I don't have time too much and thank you. So that's um, then, so then I guess I should unshare my slide and, and then I would to hand over the mic to uh, Professor David Sherman. Okay, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you, Joe and Ambuj, for organizing this uh, terrific uh, series. Um, through the series, we've seen different disciplinary approaches to understanding the COVID-19 crisis, to both kind of guide us in our understanding of what has happened, 
what is happening and maybe to get some ideas of what's going to happen next. And to do so, uh, many speakers have looked to our, our collective experience with previous pandemics for different insights. <clears throat> so whether it's the different responses to the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and how they inform models to uh, inform public health approaches, or how last week, how the economy changed or didn't change in response to the 1968 flu pandemic, uh, we've seen different scholars from different disciplines use our collective understanding of pandemic response to try to understand what's going on now. So I teach health psychology here at UCSB, and I was interested in the 1957-1958 Asian influenza. As I was reading this book by health uh, psychologists that came out in 1960, uh, Irvin Rosenstock and Howard Leventhal, who are very uh, prominent in the field of health psychology, so a little bit of background on the 1957-58 uh, pandemic, uh, the H2N2 virus. So it was first reported in Singapore in February 1957, Hong Kong in April 1957. Um, and then it came to the coastal cities in the US in the summer. So the people knew what was coming in the United States and had time to prepare. So from the introduction of the book, uh, here is a brief description. And I think it's interesting to contrast it with what might be written a few years from now about our response to the pandemic we're undergoing. So the anticipated outbreak of Asian influenza in the US in the fall of 1957 provided an unusual opportunity to study effects of threat on epidemic impact on community action. Never before had authoritative sources, the World Health Organization, the Surgeon General, Public Health Service, warned so large a population so early of an impending nationwide epidemic. By the end of August 57, unprecedented steps had been taken to blunt the impact of the expected health crisis. The government had asked drug manufacturers to extend every effort to produce vaccine. Organized medicine had been requested to plan for early implementation of epidemic emergency services. Information media participated freely in facts to the public. Scientific forces had been organized to improve vaccine and fact-finding from disease spread. So contrast that a little bit with the current situation or one that might be written for a few years ago, for a few years from now. And looking more at the public health response, this was studied as we were preparing in 2009 for the H1N1 uh, epidemic. And what they described was how the public health service, the surgeon role, as well as societies of, of uh, uh, private organizations like the American Medical Association and the American Hospital Association, all banded together in planning for the epidemic. National associations called in on state and local to assume responsibility for taking the lead and planning the response to the epidemic. And so what I was really struck as I was reading all is how the national experts coordinated and executed a plan across agencies, private and public. And then they committed it well to the local municipalities. And another thing that was really striking was the limited role that politicians, is mayors, governors, and the president played in the public announcements and the behind the scenes planning. Um, you know, they're mentioned for sure, but did not seem to be playing a very prominent role in the communication to the public about what is needed. And this is uh, relevant in the current day. Um, there was a recent New Yorker article that kind of struck on these themes too. And it contrasted the response of Seattle leaders uh, in New York cities. And it noted that this idea uh, is really part of the Center for Disease Control's field epidemic uh, kind of handbook. Um, it devotes an entire chapter to communication about a, during a health emergency. And to quote the article by Charles Duhigg, it indicates that there should be a lead spokesperson whom the public needs to know. Familiarity breeds trust. And that lead spokesperson should be a scientist. The former acting CDC director explained, if you have a politician on the stage, the very real risk that half the nation is going to do the opposite of what they say. So this is something that we study in the field of social psychology. Um, a collaborator of mine, uh, Jeffrey Cohen, Oxford University, published this paper on what he termed the party over policy effect uh, that shows the dominating impact of group influence on political beliefs. Uh, what uh, Professor Cohen found in this work 
is that a liberal policy um, will be favored uh, by conservatives if it is said to have been proposed by Republicans. Um, and a relatively stringent policy will be proposed by, uh, will be accepted by uh, liberal uh, students uh, if it's proposed or said to be proposed by Democrats. That is more so than the actual content of the policy. People were most influenced by who is proposing policy. And this is what uh, Ezra Klein determined, termed the depressing psychological theory that explains Washington. The tendency to place party over policy. This is something my colleagues and I have been examining in the context of support for climate policy. Uh, this is my colleagues, uh, Lee Van Boven and uh, Philip Eric. Um, what we did in a study that was published a couple of years ago is we introduced uh, two policies uh, related to climate change, a cap and trade policy and a, and a revenue neutral carbon tax. And we introduced them to a large sample of Americans as either being proposed and supported by uh, Democrats in the House of Representatives or proposed and supported by Republicans in the House of Representatives. And then we asked them whether they themselves would support either of these policies. So along the y-axis here is support for the policy. And what we can see is that when the policy was said to be proposed by Democrats, Democrats supported it more than Republicans. But when the policy was said to be proposed by Republicans, Republicans in red supported it much more than Democrats. And independents were relatively uninfluenced by the manipulation. So we thought that it was relevant to how people are understanding what comes next as we think about the different policy proposals that could be advanced uh, by governments around the world. And so I'm going to talk with you about a recent study that we conducted uh, that's being uh, led by the team described uh, at the top there um, and as part of a larger group uh, that is uh, examining this from a number of international perspectives. Okay, so in our study, which was conducted um, just about um, one month ago, um, it was with a large online sample, and we introduced uh, two policies that we wanted to create about what comes next. And these were based on different uh, op-eds, policy papers, uh, and as well as the status quo. And we proposed two different three-point plans to guide policy. Okay, so participants were randomly assigned to one of these two plans. One of them had a more of a public health focus. This, focus fo this plan focused on public health as the best we can do for the economy is to beat the virus however long that takes. So it recommended practice social distancing for a longer period of time, six to 12 months, to expand testing with the purpose of understanding the spread of the virus. And, the pro and it proposed that the infected would be isolated so that they could receive the best possible care. After participants received that, condition, the other half received the economic and public health focus that emphasized that the plan would focus on stimulating the economy and averting the negative health outcomes that could come with a prolonged economic downturn. So this one called for a much shorter period of social distancing and sheltering in place of one to two months. The purpose of expanded testing was to understand the regions of the country and the eight cohorts most affected with the goal of introducing and facing back healthy and immune workers back into the workplace, while at the same time sequestering those who are at greatest risk for coronavirus. Okay, our outcome measure was policy support. So we asked participants to what extent they supported or opposed this proposed three-part plan. Okay, so first off, um, in our large sample, uh, there was support for the economic and public health plan than the public health focused plan. Uh, the plans differed along many dimensions and the, and the purpose wasn't really to compare those two, but to set the stage uh, for the other independent variable in the study. So we told participants to suppose that the plan, to, to imagine that the plan, to suppose that the plan was proposed by the following. And we had four different conditions. So in the Democrat support condition, we said, suppose a Democrat proposed the plan. The Democrat group that consists major Democratic elected officials and prominent liberal policy analysis and think tanks, and was supported by the current Democratic presidential nominee. In the Republican support condition, analogous, uh, analogous text that 
uh, the Republican group that consists of major Republican elected officials and prominent conservative policy analysts and included support of the president. In the bipartisan condition, we asked them to suppose it was supported by both. We also included a fourth condition, an experts condition, that was drawn from an interdisciplinary team of experts, medical doctors, economists, scientists, and nonpartisan policy analysts. Suppose they proposed that plan um, and that the experts came from a range of institutions and organizations. Okay, so what did we find? Along the y-axis is support for the policy, um, higher numbers indicating more support. Looking first at our partisans, those who indicate they were Democrats or Republicans, we observe the party over policy effect. Um, when Democrats uh, were said to, to support the policy, or to suppose that Democrats supported it, Democratic subjects supported it more. And when Republican subjects were, Republicans were said to support the policy, Republican subjects supported it more. This is for both of the policies that we saw. The bipartisan condition was just as supported as the in-group. That is, uh, people did not go against the bipartisan condition just because the other side supported it. But what was led to the most support uh, than all the other conditions was the expert framing. Okay, when it was said to be supported by, or introduced by a bipartisan or nonpartisan group of pol public policy and health experts, it was the most support of the policy. And as we saw before, overall, the independent subjects were less affected by this manipulation. Okay, why might this be? Well, one hypothesis we had was that, well, maybe people just trust the, their own side more. And so we wanted to examine how much they trust or distrust each of the following groups. Okay, we changed the, the figure a bit. So now we're comparing in-group frame versus out-group frame. And we see that Democrats and Republicans alike, they had much greater trust in the in-group than for the, uh, for the out-group. The bipartisan group was trusted just as much, but for all, for Democrats and Republicans alike, the expert group uh, was trusted most. Participants put the most trust in the experts. Okay, so to return to the uh, from the former CDC director, if the lead the lead spokesperson should be a scientist, if you have a politician stage, there's a very real risk half the nation is do the opposite of what they say, and we observed that in our experimental results around the country and around the world. We're seeing the prominence of experts who are uh, communicating um, the state of the state, the state of the nation, and the state of policy uh, to their people. Uh, Amy Acton, the Ohio Department of Health Director, has uh, re received a claim for her public health pronouncements uh, to the citizens. And so as we think about what comes next, it's important to think about not just what comes in terms of policy, but who is communicating the policy. So a few take home points. Whatever comes next is going to involve difficult trade-offs and require public, pu public support. The party over policy effect is a major barrier to that support. It's important to see that it was observed for Democrats and Republicans alike. It's often easy to see bias when it comes from the other side, much harder to see when it's coming from your own side or even yourself. And that's one of the reasons why we conduct research along these lines. We observe that the public values and trusts experts. Uh, when experts proposed a policy, it led to increased and indeed consensus of support. Republicans, Democrats, uh, and independents alike all supported the policy more when it was proposed by an interdisciplinary group of experts. The last take home point is that multiple perspectives are needed. Um, our expert condition was uh, consisted of disciplinary experts across fields. Obviously, there's a lot of dis uh, questions within fields as to what the state of the science is and the, and the state of the economy and so forth. Um, but this shows that a dis multidisciplinary approach, much like this multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary seminar, uh, can be an effective way of finding consensus that the public can trust. And then multiple perspectives are also needed to try to understand policy and policy communication across countries. And this 
our uh, international research team is eager to uh, continue to study as we uh, look at the responses to uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, around the world. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, and I'd also like to add that uh, if you're the type of person who likes to watch uh, Zoom messages about COVID-19, I'm also conducting a series of interviews about health psychology and COVID-19. And if you're interested in checking those out, you can see them uh, on my webpage. And with that, I will uh, stop sharing and turn it over to uh, Professor, uh, Professor Robin Abbey. Great, thank you, Dave. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen now since everyone else was so successful at doing it. Let's see if I can too. There we go. Okay, so hopefully you can all hear me. Thank you all for being here and tuning in and thank you to my panelists and also to Joe and to Ambush for including me on this. Um, my area of research focuses on the use of media and stress. So when this came up, it seemed like a, uh, unfortunately, a natural um, context to explore some of the issues I've been uh, interested in. And we're obviously in a time of unprecedented stress. I mean, our, when we think about COVID-19 and the stressors, they're numerous. I mean, first and foremost, the concern over our physical well-being for ourselves and our loved ones. There's uh, stressors and challenges around the social and physical distancing, financial strain, relational strain, schedule disruptions, supply chain disruptions, enhanced uncertainty about what's going, going on. So, um, you know, it's uh, a moment where I think we all just need to stop and take a deep breath and I, okay. And you know, the concern about stress isn't just that it's uncomfortable. I mean, yes, psychologically it can be, it can be hard to bear, but there are physiological consequences that can lead to illness down the line. Uh, the relational strain that can lead to conflict in, uh, in, within families. So there's a lot of ways in which it's not just stress, right? It's um, you know, a burden that we carry that can have long-term implications um, as we move forward. So the big question then becomes, um, how do we cope with stress? And the coping literature suggests two broad categories um, of um, ways that we can cope with stress. The first is called uh, problem-focused strategies. And those really involve the um, practical ways to address or remove uh, the cause of the stress. So um, in the context of COVID, it could be things like um, washing your hands, um, uh, the social distancing, uh, how do we get our needs met uh, like through, um, sorry, I, I'm seeing a lot of um, chat and I'm just not sure whether you can all hear me or not. So I'm, I'm hoping that you can, um, but if I can just, uh, see what that chat is. Okay, so it sounds like you guys can all hear me. So sorry for that interruption, but I want to make sure that I was not just talking and no one could hear me. Okay, so going back to practical ways to address or remove the causes um, of the stressor. Again, in the context of COVID, we can wash our hands. We can learn what appropriate social distancing is. How do we commute from home? Do we have the right technology? How do we get our food safely to us? And that's ways that we can deal with the stressor of the actual virus. Um, but then there's um, the other types of um, uh, uh, strategies that help us deal with the negative affect associated uh, with having to deal with all of this, which are called emotion-focused strategies. So when people are telling you to take a breath, meditate, do something fun, relax, breathe, that those are all strategies that can help us deal with the emotions uh, around what the stressor is, even if it doesn't fix or solve the problem. And when we look at what um, health organizations at the local or uh, regional or national levels are recommending, you see a range of these kinds of strategies. So these are just a few of the um, graphics I found if you, you know, looking online. And we see the, you know, we need to manage our emotions, right? Find our inner peace and do mindful breathing. Remember that we're all connected, right? It doesn't fix the problem, but maybe it helps us feel better. Uh, we need to unwind. Do things that you love. Think positively. Take deep breaths. Stay away from media because that's going to make you feel bad. That's a sort of common refrain that we hear. Uh, we can move on to adding to, um, to that. Make sure that you avoid doing the unhealthy things. Don't eat unhealthy food. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't do drugs. Um, and, uh, uh, get informed, you know, get, get um, the facts, get uh, you know, accurate information. When we look at what the National Institutes of Mental Health says, um, as well as the CDC, they both have almost exactly the same um, graphic, just in different forms, where we see both emotion-focused and problem-focused um, strategies being suggested to the public. So take care of your body physically, get that social support that can help us feel better, 
decompress and unwind, but also set our goals and priorities, get information so that we know how to act. So this is the kind of uh, suggestions and recommendations that we see out there. I'm sure you've seen them and maybe you've even implemented a few. Okay, so where does media fit in all of this? As a media effects scholar, I, you know, I study emotion in media, so I'm just you know, so curious. Like, what is the conversation around media in this domain? And as it turns out, the literature on coping doesn't really talk about media very much. It turns out media gets a bad rap, you know, that uh, we tend to um, have these ideas that it leads to more negative outcomes than positive. Um, and it is absolutely the case that, that media consumption, depending on the context, by whom, when, where, et cetera, can lead to negative outcomes. Um, but generally speaking, the role of media is very poorly conceived in the context of coping. So what we see are things like warning of too much news, you know, that watching too much news is just gonna upset you. So you need to take a break. Yes, it gives you information, but watch out because that can really be um, devastating to you. Um, there are concerns over um, uh, too much social media. So for example, you might have, um, you know, uh, jealousy, envy, anxiety, depression over social um, media postings in the context of COVID, um, you know, a little bit less of that discussion. We see a little bit more of the value of the social connection that we get as a result of social media. But generally speaking, the idea of too much social media is probably not good for us. What about entertainment media? Well, presumably the entertainment media fits into that you need to unwind category, that that's where, you know, along with crocheting and golf, gardening and baking, that these are things that we do, you know, to just decompress. We don't really understand it as its own entity, but it's just a, you know, one of a, a laundry list of things that we can do to try to feel better. But here's the thing about media. Again, we have the stigma and we carry it with us ourselves um, around how much media and what type of media we use. So the idea of too much screen time, I mean, we've been hearing this for decades, particularly warnings for kids, but there's also this thought like, you know, if you say to me, hey, I went golfing yesterday for six hours, I, I'd be pretty impressed. If I told you I watched television for six hours, you'd probably start to wonder about me a little bit. So this isn't something that we necessarily feel good or proud about when we spend a lot of time with screens. Second, um, the type of media that's consumed, there's some stigma around that as well. So you might um, watch documentaries and I'd be really impressed with you, but if I'm watching reality TV and soap operas, again, you might you know, have a few thoughts about um, kind of where I'm at. So the, the issue here is that even if we're turning to the media to unwind, um, and it can be valuable for that, and there's a whole literature on mood management that suggests we do turn to media for this purpose, if we feel guilty or embarrassed around how much or what type of media we're using, that can actually add to our stress burden rather than um, take away from it. So the key questions I was interested in as COVID began to emerge um, was how are people coping with, with stress? And where does media fit into this complex? And particularly, how does it relate to emotion-focused and problem-focused um, coping strategies and outcomes? So in this, um, uh, study, and uh, we've, we've got a few going on, but this first one we launched um, in the third week of March. It is a, um, a national sample of about 560 so um, adults, uh, quota matched um, to the U.S. Census. So um, we, you know, all across the country, in that week, just at the point that we were transitioning into social distancing, um, and I'll just show you this graphic. Hopefully you can see it's based on geolocation data of cell phones moving around. And I'm sorry that California is not on there, but due to privacy laws, our data is not collected and displayed. But what you see here is that in the first week of March, um, things are pretty normal. People are moving around, right, going about their business. And then as we start moving into um, the second week, uh, the national emergency was declared at the end of this week. We see there's a little more slowdown. Um, by the third week, when we started our data collection, you see on the eastern uh, east coast and in Seattle that people are really traveling less. And by the end of the week of our data collection, we see that the social distancing um, is uh, really taking hold based on actual people moving around. So we really were catching people at that point where we're beginning to move into um, that behavior. And there's a lot of uncertainty about where things are going, a lot that's changing. And where there's uncertainty, invariably there is stress. 
And what we were interested in, so it's a, it was quite an um, extensive survey, and I'm just going to discuss a few pieces of it here. Um, but what we were interested in were um, people's stress around COVID in particular. Uh, second, what is their frequency of using various media to cope with COVID? Not just their use of media, but using media to cope. Um, we did ask about frequency of media use and all these different types, TV shows, social media, video games, texting, news, browsing, uh, the internet, et cetera. So we controlled on frequency. We want to know their intentional use to cope. Third, we asked about um, their coping strategies beyond media, the types that we've heard about already, exercise, deep breathing, um, eating healthy, social support, and those sorts of things. And then the outcomes we were most interested in were coping efficacy, that is, how well do you feel like you're handling what's going on right now? And we were interested in the extent to which people were um, practicing social distancing um, as that becomes the recommendation. So. Um, I just want to be really clear that this is a new data set for us and we're still processing it and going through. As I said, it's fairly extensive. So this is very preliminary. Um, and so as I move forward, I just hope you'll keep that in mind. I also want to let you know that we did in, in any of the statistical analyses, we controlled on demographics, political ideology, and as I mentioned before, frequency of the relevant media use. So the first thing we did was ask about stress and coping efficacy. And we expected stress the more stressed you are, the less efficacious you feel like your coping is. And we find that relationship here. So that was no surprise, but it did give us a sense that people were actually completing our survey and reading the questions, which is, you know, is a nice thing. Um, for um, the, the next piece here was just an open-ended question. How are you coping? What are you doing to cope with the stress of COVID? They could list as many things as they wanted. We just, for the purposes of this presentation, I just pulled the number one coping strategy, the first thing that they mentioned and um, grouped it by media-based versus the emotion-focused type strategies and problem-focused, which um, hopefully you can see on the screen there. So for media strategies, number one was TV and movies. So over 10% of the sample, the very first thing they said was, I'm watching TV, I'm binging Netflix. Right? Uh, second was reading for pleasure, then music, social media, video games, and news. So this is just unsolicited. A lot of people mentioning how they're turning to media to help themselves cope. When we look at the emotion focus, we see again, these are coming up as well, just not as frequently. So praying came up, um, it's pretty high, 25. So half the amount of people who are watching TV said they were praying, sleeping, meditating, talking, some people not taking the CDC's advice and they're smoking and drinking alcohol, um, cleaning or just staying busy in the house, uh, exercising and eating. Um, and then finally for um, uh, a problem, Focus coping, there's washing hands and social distancing um, that came up. But across the board, hopefully what you see is that media strategies uh, are the ones that people are turning to, particularly uh, TV uh, and movies. Now next I want to move into um, our statistical analyses based on our closed-ended measures of stress. And we had a few different indicators. So for those of you familiar with structural equation modeling, the stress is a combination of a couple different indicators of stress around COVID. Um, and we were associating those with the uh, frequency of uh, the consumption of all these different types of uh, media. So this question was, how frequently are you using each of these to cope with COVID? And you'll see that stress was associated with every single one of them. Okay. Um, and the range of associations was about um, 0.12 to 0.39, I believe, 0.38, 0.39. So, this was, you know, small to, to um, moderate correlations or associations between the more stressed you are, the more you're doing these things. What about other coping strategies? The more stressed people were, the more they were napping, meditating, praying, and eating either healthy or unhealthy. Those were smaller relationships, about a 0.1 to 0 0.2. Um, and turns out people who are stressed are not thinking positively. Um, nor are they, they exercising, but we still see some of these other coping strategies emerging. So the next analysis I want to show you is in a structural equation model, recognizing this is cross-sectional data, so I'm not trying to claim causality as much as demonstrate what we believe the process is likely to be of stress, these coping strategies, and coping efficacy. So the first part of the model shows that the more stressed people are, the more they're watching television movies for coping, the more they're listening to music and the healthier they're eating. So those three emerged. 
And as we look at how that relates to coping efficacy, we see that really the only relationship, we still see stress and coping efficacy relate to one another negatively, but the only indirect relationship of the coping strategies was TV shows and movies. So those who are more stressed are watching more TV and movies, and if they're watching more TV and movies, they feel like they're coping better. So there seems to be um, a real value from an emotional standpoint to media consumption within this context. Let me move on in the time I have left to talk about social distancing. And this was a very new thing of the week we were collecting data. People who are more stressed said that they were um, social distancing more. Um, so it's a sort of small to you know, moderate get in their uh, association, but that's their problem focused coping. What happens when we look at the coping strategies? Again, we see those who are more stressed are watching more TV and movies. They're consuming more news in its various formats to cope, and they're posting more on social media, as well as eating healthy and unhealthy. And as we see how all this relates to social distancing, we see that news consumption is the media, um, so the relevant media variable here, that those who are more stressed uh, are also consuming more news to cope, and those consuming more news to cope are also social distancing more. So it seems as though news is playing an important role here in helping those who are stressed to find a way to engage in problem-focused coping. And uh, as you see down there, that, that eating has something to do with all of this as well. So in terms of key takeaways, again, I want to highlight the fact that I'm not trying to claim causality with this data set, um, but more um, trying to design a sort of, I, based on what we know about the literature, what would um, make sense in terms of what order might be. But what we can take away from this is that media use, TV and movies in particular, can be a really valuable emotional coping resource. It's cheap and readily available. Right? It takes zero skills to, to, to execute other than knowing how to operate your remote control, which sometimes befuddles me, but still, right? It doesn't take much skill. You can do it for as long as you need it, whenever you need it. And it provides a sense of normalcy, right? That this is something that we do anyway. We don't social distance normally. I'm not wearing gloves and goggles um, and a mask normally, but I do watch TV. So when we're there watching our favorite shows, then that gives us a sense that, you know, life is not entirely different um, and that we have some comfort in that. There's also a vast range of content that we can use to regulate our moods and to escape whatever suits our purpose. So in this digital age, almost everything is available to us. Also, there's um, some value in news. It's not just something to avoid. Too much is problematic, and we see that in our data. But when it's used for coping, people are going to the news to get information. It can be a very valuable resource for us. So as um, I wrap up here, um, some of the other research we're doing right now, we have a panel study where we're following uh, the same participants. Um, we're doing the, the follow-up uh, this week where we're looking at adults, we're doing parents as well, and looking at how media use at the time one predicts coping behavior as well as their um, psychological well-being, relational satisfaction, and those sorts of um, uh, indicators at time two. We have data looking at how people who identify with celebrities who have been diagnosed with COVID, like Tom Hanks and Pink, um, how that influences their likelihood of social distancing. Uh, the short answer is it does. Um, and we're working on designing some studies on what we call media prescriptions, which are basically how can we choose the kinds of media that can help alleviate stress and give them to people in small doses across days to help uh, regulate. Um, their negative affect. So ultimately, I think a big takeaway here is that media is not good or bad, right? Media is a tool, and it's a tool that can be harnessed for coping with crisis. And what we hope, one of the silver linings of, you know, what we're all going through is that perhaps we can learn more about how media uh, can serve that purpose for us. So um, I will stop there. Thank you all very much, and I'll turn it back to Joe and Amish. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, thank you to all of our panelists today. It was uh, re really enlightening and a different take on the kinds of things that we've been looking at in this series.